Welcome, I'm Ted McCollum with the Texas AgriLife Extension Service. In this segment of the program, we're going to review the Texas Cattle Feeders Association Beef Safety and Quality Assurance Program. And the portion we'll be going through in this segment is the cattle care and handling portion of the program. In today's environment, livestock producers need to be concerned more than ever about our handling and management practices of the animals we use to produce food for consumers. Our production practices, our handling, our management are under more scrutiny today than they ever have been. If we go back and look at a consumer survey conducted in 2008 by the Center for Food Integrity, we'll notice that one of the items focused on by the consumers in this survey was that producers should be held responsible for the proper and humane treatment of livestock that we use to produce food, whether that is a dairy product or a meat product. So in order to maintain consumer confidence in the beef industry, one of our focuses should be that we manage, handle and manage cattle properly throughout our production system, from the cow-calf operations through the feed yards. Dr. Tom Field with NCBA recently summarized other consumer survey information about animal handling and care practices and, and consumers' views of these. And six of the major concerns are listed on this slide. The first would be stunning and handling practices at the time of slaughter. This is something of concern for the processors in our industry, not the producers. But an issue underneath this would be our management and care of non-ambulatory animals, those animals that are suffering some, from some physical ailment that prevents them from standing and moving about. We need to concentrate on developing and following through with humane euthanasia procedures for these animals. Second on this would be space requirements and density. In recent history, this is more of a concern in the poultry and the pork industries. But we also need to remember in the feed yard industry, we do deal with stocking densities in pens and matching the right amount of bunk space and the right amount of floor space in our pens to cattle numbers to manage both performance and health of those animals. Third would be practices that are perceived to be painful by those of us that may not be in the livestock industry. These are practices such as dehorning, castration of intact males, uh, tail docking was listed. That's a practice that's in the dairy industry, not really a great concern in the beef industry. But again, these are practices that are thought to be painful. And so our management and appropriate use of those practices needs to be focused upon. Fourth would be animal handling and transportation. How do we handle animals and how do we transport animals? Fifth would be on-farm euthanasia, and that's partly back in reference to the non-ambulatory animals. If we have animals that are the, at the end of their life or suffering from some terminal illness, uh, humanely euthanizing those animals so they don't suffer any more than they have to. And number six would be antibiotic usage, the use of growth implants and bait agonists, which are feed additives. These are all covered in another portion of the Texas Cattle Feeders Beef Safety and Quality Assurance Program. Viewing this list and the public scrutiny that we're under, in the beef cattle industry, we must ensure and demonstrate that our handling and care practices promote the health and well-being of the cattle we manage through the use of safe, scientifically-based practices and also provide a low stress, as low stress an environment for those animals during our production, in our production systems. By doing this, we can build what's called a pyramid of trust. By using the principles of good stockmanship, and having a proactive program to advance the best management practices in our operations and then verifying that we're following through with those production practices, we gain public acceptance and we improve the trust from our consumers that we are humanely managing the animals that we utilize to produce food. Once again, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association has had a beef quality assurance program for over 20 years. One of the focuses of this program is the proper handling and management of cattle. These practices, again, apply all the way from the cow-calf segment of the industry through the feed yard, and this is a voluntary program. The Texas Cattle Feeders Association program added cattle care and handling to their beef safety and quality assurance program a few years ago. And to reiterate, the Texas Cattle Feeders Association yards that participate in the program are audited annually to ensure that the protocols and requirements for the TCFA program are being met. This is a two-part audit, one being the beef safety and quality portion of the audit, which was reviewed in an earlier presentation or another presentation. The second part then would be cattle handling practices on the feed yard. This portion of the audit 
was added in 2003, where the program was updated to include cattle handling guidelines. At that time, it was not mandatory for certification. It was a report card for the feed yard. How are you practicing? What do your practices look like? In 2010, this portion of the audit has become a requirement that if the, if the yard is going to participate in the TCFA BSQA program, they must participate and allow the Texas Cattle Feeders Association to conduct a cattle care and handling audit on the feed yard. So let's review what is included in the cattle care and handling audit portion of the TCFA program so that you can become acquainted with the <coughs> practices that are being implemented and also if you're an employee of a yard or, or moving into that uh, type of that arena of employment, you become familiar with what the requirements would be uh, working on that working for a feed yard. Okay, we'll start with the rival and treatment program segment of the audit. The, the TCFA guideline states that preventative health management programs for newly arrived cattle and treatment programs for cattle with health problems must be designed by a veterinarian. The veterinarian is the professional trained in animal health and well-being. He or she are the individuals that are most up to date with current knowledge, current information, a world of experience working with large populations of cattle, and they therefore have the best information, the best grounding for developing proper management and treatment programs for both preventing health problems as well as treating those health problems. So that's why this is a requirement of the program. Underneath the rival programs, this would include vaccination and medication protocols for incoming cattle, castration, dehorning, and other procedures that may occur upon arrival at the feed yard. Under treatment programs, this would include protocols for treating cattle suffering from injuries or other illnesses. Or the employee responsibilities at the feed yard would be to follow those protocols and then communicate any problems or failures in those protocols to the management and to the veterinarian so that adjustments can be made to improve those treatment and arrival programs. A second requirement would be the area dealing with non-ambulatory or downer cattle, those animals that have an ailment and cannot stand or walk and do not have a chance of recovery. One of the concerns is how are those cattle moved? If an animal is a downer animal or non-ambulatory in a pen, if the animal is going to be moved from that pen to a re rehabilitation area, how is that animal moved? The second would be if that animal has no prob a low probability of recovering from whatever the ailment is, what are the euthanasia protocols that will be used at the feed yard? In terms of movement of the non-ambulatory cattle, some general guidelines. Cattle should not be dragged by a chain, a rope, or any other means to remove them from a pen. The cattle should not be lifted or suspended in the air by a chain, a rope, or any other means and the cattle should not be scooped into buckets or loaders to move them. The recommended protocol or procedures would be that the cattle are rolled completely into a loader bucket and then once they are moved to the location where they'll be rehabbed that they would be rolled out of that bucket. Another procedure that is often used is to develop a sled which is pushed, pulled behind a tractor and the animals would be rolled onto that sled and the sled would be pulled to the rehabilitation area and the animals would be rolled off of that sled. So once again, no dragging, no lifting, no scooping, roll the animals into a bucket or onto a sled, move them out and then roll them out of the bucket or off the sled once they've reached the location to which they're being moved. As far as euthanasia is concerned, cattle should be humanely euthanized within 24 to 36 hours of the onset of an injury or a health problem from which the veterinarian or other management staff deems that there is a low probability of recovery. Do not allow the animal to lay and suffer. The procedure for euthanasia should be reviewed and approved by the veterinarian that consults with the feed yard. And these may include the appropriate use of firearms or, and or chemical procedures uh, in the euthanasia process. A next area of concern would be cattle comfort. And the TCFA guidelines say that cattle should have free access to feed water and to move freely around pens. We would hope that this is the ultimate goal of everyone. We need animals to have access to feed water and move freely around pens so that they can produce efficiently and grow well and produce a good product. 
Some of the items that may be of concern here would be what is the stocking rate or stocking density in our pens? How much bunk space are we allowing per head of animal in the pen? Do we have waterers that are the proper size and function properly to provide the adequate amount of water to the cattle in the pen? And finally, our feed management protocols. How often are cattle being fed? Are the feed deliveries timely? How do we manage storm periods <clears throat> in terms of making sure cattle have feed during storms and other issues? Next section would be under cattle handling. And in this, the auditors or TCFA would evaluate the cattle and the procedures that are being utilized in the processing area. And during an audit, this is uh, evaluated by observing the processing of 100 head of cattle as they move through the processing facility. These may be cattle that have just arrived to the feed yard or they may be cattle that have been in residence in the feed yard for a period of time. The observations as these cattle are observed would be to look at the behavior and flow of the cattle as they move through the processing facility, but also to look at the actions of the people that are handling the cattle. Again, this is important because the handle and transport of cattle needs to, be, needs to occur in a fashion that we minimize the possibility of stress, injury, and bruising of those cattle. Let's walk through a portion of the audit to show you what would be evaluated. This tends to be the portion of the audit that uh, <clears throat> causes more concern among the folks because we are standing there watching the people do the work and writing down a score. But uh, hopefully by walking through this and giving an idea of what the auditors would evaluate would ease some people's concerns, but also demonstrate to others what we're actually observing and why. One of the things we would look at or observe is how many cattle vocalize after being restrained but before any procedures are implemented. So for instance, a, a, a steer walks into the chute, they're restrained in the squeeze chute before any needles are used to administer an injection or before any ear tags are put in the animal's ears, is the animal vocalizing, which might demonstrate that the animal's under stress. Either the pressure on the chute's too tight or there's something else uh, causing the animal to feel some pain or be uncomfortable. In the audit, out of the 100 head of cattle that will be observed, you're allowed for five head to vocalize in the manner that I just described. If six head or ten head vocalize, so you exceed that threshold, then the question becomes, what's the reason for that vocalization? Do we go check the pressure on the chute? Do we check for pieces of metal that may be protruding that's causing discomfort in the animal? Or, or whatever may be causing that vocalization. In some cases, it may just be the nature of the cattle. We, the auditors realize that there are cattle that behave differently, and some cattle just vocalize more than others <coughs> without any stimulation. The second item that would be scored is how many cattle fall exiting from the chute. And a fall would be where an animal would actually go down and potentially their brisket or their stomach or part of the animal actually touches the ground as they leave the chute because they tripped, stumbled, and fell. You're allowed two head out of 100 in the audit to fall on the way, on, out of the chute. Once again, if that exceeds 2%, the question becomes, why did the cattle fall? Was there a problem with the footing in front of the chute? Was it due to some handling practice used previously and the cattle were overstimulated when they entered the chute and therefore were overstimulated leaving and caused them to fall? The third area would be how many cattle trip or stumble while exiting the sheep. A trip or a stumble would be, as it says, they trip or they stumble, but they don't fall to the ground. You're allowed 10 head out of 100. Once again, if it exceeds 10 head, the question becomes, why did they trip or stumble? Fourth would be how many cattle jump or run exiting the sheep. And this can be a fairly sub subjective call and sometimes. This may be the nature of the cattle causing them to jump and run, or it may be, again, overstimulation by the handlers or some other issue. But in this case, you're allowed 25 out of 100 head to jump and run as they leave the chute. Once again, if you exceed that threshold, the question becomes why did we exceed the threshold? And finally, how many times was a hot shot or electrical prod used on cattle during the time that they were going through the processing barn? You're allowed 10 head out of 100. If you exceed the 10 head or 10%, why was that occurring? Was it because the employee simply was overusing the electrical prod? 
or was it due to shadows or lighting in the processing area that were causing cattle to balk and therefore not move and, and lead to the use of the electrical prods? Again, the question becomes why and can we take actions to make the system, make the cattle flow better? Other items that might be noted is the use of other cattle driving items, whether it be a paddle, a stick, or whatever. Is it necessary if there's overuse on those lines that are occurring? Also, excessive noise. Uh, if there's a lot of noise inside the processing barn, that may cause the cattle to balk, or become overstimulated, and then create problems uh, listed up elsewhere. Again, why are these a concern? Stress on cattle influences both health and performance of the cattle. And our job in the feed yard should be to promote good health and good efficient performance in the cattle. And stress is a negative for those characteristics. Also, potential injury of the cattle. Broken legs, shoulders that are bruised that cause animals to be lame, other issues that affect performance, health, and stress, and just uh, overall well-being of the animals. Behavior and flow. If we note problems with the way cattle are moving through the processing facility, what are potential reasons for those problems and things that might need to be evaluated or adjusted or modified? It could, as, as I mentioned earlier, it could just be the inherent behavior of the cattle. There are wild cattle. There are cattle that are more docile and in between. And the auditors will note those problems. It could be lighting or shadows in the processing facilities. Cattle's perception or visual perceptions <clears throat> are different than ours. A shadow through the middle of a snake or an alley may appear to be a hole to an animal and cause them to balk and not want to move past that. A light in the wrong place may be blinding the animals. Other issues such as this can lead to cattle balking and that may show up as animals that were had excessive prod use or some other thing and it was <clears throat> due to poor lighting or poor shadows or bad shadows potentially. Excessive noise, I've already talked about that, from equipment banging and making noise to people yelling to stereos playing loud music, uh, again, may change the way animals flow through a facility. Some of our facilities are not built the best in the world. Uh, we're not saying everyone needs to go out and spend the money to redesign their facilities, but they may need to work, learn how to work better with the facilities that they have available to them. Equipment designs or malfunctions, this might be such as a, a squeeze chute or something along these lines where cattle are vocalizing excessively or we're noting a lot of cattle tripping as they exit the chute. There may be some, something with the design of the head gate or the chute or the, that is causing the animal to have discomfort or trip or fall as they leave that chute. <clears throat> Positioning of, it, of the employees in the area. Many times people that work in these facilities may be the newest employees on the feed yards. They may not understand where to stand to avoid having cattle balk so that they'll move easily through a facility. So a lot of times some of this is employee education on where they need to stand or where they need to be to uh, make cattle move more easily through our facilities. And again, that would fall in with the employee habits or training or lack of training. Habitual use of electric prods could be a problem. Or again, lack of training on how to properly use an electrical prod or how to properly move cattle through a facility. <coughs> A lot of those problems could be solved with some, just some good employee training. Now we move outside and begin to look at facilities. And what will be evaluated would be the loading and unloading areas, the processing <coughs> facilities, the hospital barns and the hospital pens. But what we're looking for here to see is if, are those facilities, the gates, the chutes, other things, are they properly functioning? And there's, is there a, the absence of potential problems that may affect the health or injure cattle as they're in those facilities. We will look at the presence or absence and the condition of non-slip flooring in working areas. Are there rubber floor mats? <clears throat> is there textured concrete, graded concrete or whatever that gives the animals better footing as they move into and out of the facilities? What's the condition and state of repair of gates, fences, crowding alleys, snakes, and other things. Are the gates working properly? Is the metal welded properly? Are there areas where the animals might be cut or injured? And then also the buildup of the manure and dirt in those areas. This is more of a, an indication of how, what kind of attention is paid to those, those facilities, but also if we're concerned about footing, an excessive buildup of manure and dirt in these areas 
can render our non-slip flooring or concrete that we've put in to help with footing can render that less effective. And these will be rated as excellent, acceptable, or unacceptable as we look at these characteristics of those facilities. What's excellent? Excellent could be deep grooved or well-maintained non-slip footing. All gates, fences, and chutes are in good working order and repair. And there's no significant buildup of dirt or manure in the areas. Acceptable would be the grooved footing or non-slip footing is present, but it may be becoming worn or smooth. Gates, fences, and chutes may need, be in need of minor repairs, or there may be a minor buildup of dirt or manure in the facility. Unacceptable would be slick flooring with or no non-slip flooring. Gates, fences, or chutes are in need of major repairs, or that there's a major buildup of dirt or manure in the areas. Notice that nowhere in this list or description of these facilities does it say that a facility has to be new and state-of-the-art. We're talking about functional and in good state of repair. Water troughs. We're out in the pens now looking at the water troughs and the, and the conditions of the pens. What we will look at is we'll evaluate 10 waterers randomly across the yard in pens. We'll rate those waters as acceptable or unacceptable and at least 80% of the waters that are checked must be rated acceptable. Once again, what's an acceptable water, what's an unacceptable water? Acceptable is that water in the trough is clear and in an adequate supply. There may be a minor buildup of algae growth in the water. There may be a minor accumulation of feedstuffs or other foreign matter in the water. Unacceptable would be that water in the trough is murky, unclear, or in an inadequate supply that there's a major growth and buildup of algae in the water, or that there's a major accumulation of feedstuffs or other foreign materials in that water. Why is this of concern from an animal well-being standpoint? Well, these may contribute to the transmission of disease or creation of food safety concerns in the animals. It may affect the palatability and acceptability of the water for cattle. Water intake and feed intake are intimately related. If there's something that is <coughs> suppressing water intake by the cattle, we'll tend to suppress feed intake by the cattle and affect performance and well-being of those animals. An adequate supply of water. Once again, if there's not an adequate supply, cattle can't consume enough, we may affect performance through feed intake <coughs> issues. Okay, we've evaluated the waters in the pens. Now we're going to look at the feed box. Again, we walk through the yard, go across the yard, and we evaluate 10 feed bunks across the yard randomly. We rate the bunks as acceptable or unacceptable. 80% of the bunks must be rated acceptable to pass. What's an acceptable feed bunk? Well, the feed bunk is clean and free of foreign matter. There's no mold or spoiled feed present in the feed bunk. There's no dirt, mud, or manure built up in the feed bunk. What's unacceptable? Mold and or spoil feed present in the bunk, dirt, mud, or manure build up in the feed bunk. Rarely do I see a problem with these except in our hospital pens. Where I've seen problems in feed yards would be in our hospital pens. And this goes for the waterers that we talked about previously. Most of the time if I see a water that's rated unacceptable, a lot of times it will be in our hospital pens. And we would hope in our hospital pens those would be the cleanest waters and cleanest feed bunks since that's where, tr where we're trying to rehab and, and <clears throat> have animals recovery from a disease recover from a disease problem. Why are these of concern? Once again, transmission of disease or some food safety concerns might be related to how our feed bunks are managed, palatability and acceptability of the feed. Our business in the feed yard is to present feed to cattle, have them consume that feed and efficiently turn it into a food product. So feed palatability and acceptability is very important. Once again, feed intake is equal to performance and health of the animals. While we're in the pens, we'll rate pen conditions, and this we'll look at mud scores. Again, we look at 10 pens across the yard. This time we're looking at the mud on the cattle. We're not necessarily looking at the floor of the pen, we're looking at the cattle. We'll rate the cattle as acceptable or unacceptable, and 80% of the pens rated must be acceptable in order to pass. What's acceptable? We look out across the pen, and there's clean animals throughout the pen or there may be minor mud present on the legs and the knees of the animals, or there may be some minor mud present on the belly of the animal. What's unacceptable? Mud caked on the belly of the animals, mud caked on the sides of the animals, 
for animals struggling to walk through deep mud present in the pens. Again, why is this of concern from an animal well-being standpoint or even a food safety? Potential for transmission of food safety concerns at slaughter. If there's mud caked on the outside of the animals and once they reach the processing facility, as the hide is removed from those animals, there's a higher probability that some of that mud could end up on the carcass, which either ends up with trim loss on the carcass or if it's bad enough, may actually end up with condemnation of the entire carcass. From an animal well-being standpoint, excessive mud may represent excessive stress on the cattle and a loss of performance and potentially health problems. The impossible solutions to this would be better pen maintenance, development of mounds in the pens during the times of the year when <coughs> mud or, or rain and snow may be a, a concern. So to close, then if we look at best, pra best practice protocols that affect animal well-being, we talked about personnel training in the processing and handling of animals, good pen maintenance, proper euthanasia procedures, proper handling of non-ambulatory cattle, the use of driving aids as we handle cattle, shoot scoring to look at footing, focalization of the cattle, looking at our shoot and head catch operations on how those work in terms of extra stress on the cattle or potential injury for the animals, and then pen space requirements as that may affect performance of the animals. That completes our discussion and review of the Texas Cattle Feeders Association Beef Safety and Quality Assurance Program where we covered the issues dealing with food safety, issues, issues dealing with quality control of cattle and feedstuffs and other practices in the feed yard and cattle care and handling practices that should be implemented in the feed yard. I hope this was of assistance to you to help you appreciate better the efforts that we are going to in our feed yard industry and help you as a potential employee of the feed yard if that's your goal in life to understand, perhaps understand some of the requirements that the managers and staff may put upon you as an employee.